people come in, it's actually a pleasure to have such a full house. <laughs> I haven't seen it this full in a long time. So it, it's uh, actually... Uh, the cookies must be especially The cookies must be. <laughs> no, no I, I think it has to do more with the speaker than uh, the cookies. And uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to have uh, with us today Professor Vincent Poor from uh, uh, Princeton University. Uh, Professor Poor is a man uh, who needs no introduction, but I'll go ahead and give uh, a few things anyway. Uh, he's the Michael Henry Strato University Professor at Princeton University, where he's also currently the Dean of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Uh, his research interests, as you all know, are in the areas of stochastic analysis, uh, statistical signal processing, and information theory, and all the related applications. Uh, he's a fellow of the IEEE, member of the uh, National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Sciences, and the Royal Academy of Engineering of the UK. And uh, he has uh, several awards and uh, several honorary doctorates, including Albert University and Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and University of Edinburgh. <laughs> Who cares about Scott? <laughs> <laughs> and it's a pleasure to have him here. And uh, thank you. And please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hamid. Good, af good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Can everybody hear me okay? Tian? Happy sequester day. <laughs> well, unhappy sequester day, maybe. Uh, well, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, thank you again, Habib. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, really had a great visit here so far. Uh, surprisingly to me, this is the first time I've been to NC State, so uh, it's really, really nice to be here. And um, so I think uh, probably most of you or many of you know what smart grid is, or at least have an idea of what smart grid is. Uh, basically, uh, the idea behind smart grid is to, to take the electricity grid, which is also a very, com very complex physical system, and to impose on top of that a cyber layer of sensors, controls, communications, and all those sorts of things uh, in order to make electricity distribution more efficient, uh, and to incorporate renewables, and also to uh, incorporate uh, uh, store local storage, things like uh, electric vehicles, uh, and just generally to uh, give the, uh, to, to, to distribute the control of the network uh, and the balancing of it uh, throughout the network all the way out to the leaf nodes on the, uh, on the grid. So uh, because of this uh, cyber nature of the cyber layer, uh, there's been a lot of opportunity for people like me whose background is primarily in uh, the information sciences and systems uh, to work on problems related to energy distribution. And, uh, and that's really what I'm going to talk about today is sort of the uh, application of some of the things that I've learned from working in wireless networks and other fields like that to problems arising in uh, electricity grids. Now, just as a caveat, though, let me say that I, even though I'm an electrical engineer and I studied uh, power back when I was an undergraduate, uh, I really, th th what I don't know about uh, power systems uh, is vast. And so uh, my focus here has been more on sort of what I would call the Shannon model of looking at simple models for that part of the system and to try to get some insight from that about things that might be practical. But uh, anybody here who's a power person uh, who really knows what's going on in the power network, uh, I have to apologize in advance because I, I really don't and I don't pretend to. Uh, and every time I give a talk like this, I, I learn a lot. So I, I appreciate your uh, indulgence. Uh, so let me, uh, so what I'm going to talk about, and I only have three hours, right? Try not to take more than my time. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today are three things, uh, as the name, uh, the, the title implies. Uh, one of them is uh, the use of game theory for smart grid design. Uh, another one is uh, privacy for data sources, and specifically uh, as applied to some problems coming up and arising in smart grid. This is really an information theoretic problem. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'm going to talk about some distributed algorithms for state estimation in smart grid. So there really there are three things here, game theory, information theory, and statistical inference. 
uh, all of which, of course, have very wide application in all sorts of networking problems. And um, and I'll uh, and I'll uh, you know try to show you how, at least from my point of view, these can be applied in some smart grid applications. So let me I have a lot to do, and I only have, like I said, three hours. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly. I'll just start right in on the first topic, and this is a game theoretic methods for smart grid design. Uh, this is joint work with Walid Saad, who's a former postdoc of mine from Princeton, who's now at the University of Miami, and some other people whose names I'll call uh, as I go through. So I'm afraid this is going to be small for people in the back. I don't know if oh, you, you, maybe you can see it on these monitors, but um, I can. I'm going to tell you anyway what it says. So. You know, th there are a lot of reasons why game theory is uh, uh, of interest for something like smart grid. Part of it, one reason is that it's a heterogeneous network. There are many different kinds of nodes. There are loads. There are uh, uh, generating sources. Uh, and they all have their own uh, individual objectives. So it's like an economic system. Uh, everybody has their own objective, and they're all working together. Uh, they interact on a large scale. Uh, and it's stochastic, that is, it, it's dynamic and stochastic. It changes over time stochastically or randomly. So this is, a, like I said, it's like an economic system. Game theory has been very helpful in trying to understand economic systems, and it's, it's a lot like that. So for that reason, uh, game theory is a good thing to try or to look at here, and there's been a lot of interest in this area. Uh, and there, there are two branches of game theory, both of which are useful in this context. And I, one is a non-cooperative game theory or competitive game theory, and the other is cooperative game theory. And I'm going to uh, look at, illustrate this, uh, how this, these fields might be applied uh, just by example. Okay, so I don't, have, I don't have an overarching theory to tell you about. I'm just going to give some examples. So the first example is uh, a problem of energy trading for plug-in vehicles. So we all know what a plug-in vehicle is. It's a hybrid or an electric vehicle that you plug in at night and then you drive in the daytime. It, you tr plug in at night, you charge the battery, and you drive it in the daytime. Okay, so uh, these are storage devices on the grid. And so they can, be, they can trade energy with the grid. And uh, so one of, the pro one of the ways we can view this is we can think about groups of plug-in vehicles, plug-in vehicle groups, which uh, work together to trade energy with the grid. So you might think, for example, about a parking lot where people at work, people drive to work in the morning, plug their vehicles in, and then that parking lot works as an entity to trade energy with the grid during the daytime. So all these vehicles have um, uh, bought energy at night when it was cheap, and now they're sitting there in the daytime with surplus energy, which can be then sold into the grid, for example. So um, we can model, so, so there's, not, 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 there's not just one of these vehicle groups. There are going to be many of them, hopefully, in the future. And so they're going to be competitors in a marketplace. And that's a natural place to apply competitive game theory. Uh, and there are two uh, ways to, to look at this. One is to look at the situation where the groups are trading energy with the main grid, and the main grid is acting like a single entity. That is, it's, it's the power company, okay? In that case, uh, the, the natural kind of game formalism here is what's called a Stackelberg game or a leader-follower game, where the grid, it, the main grid, uh, is the um, the leader, and the uh, uh, electric vehicle groups are followers. So the main grid takes an action, the local vehicle groups compete with one another, uh, and then there's iteration. Okay. Another uh, way to look at this is if the main grid is actually a set of autonomous elements. So maybe a, a smaller entities that want to buy power, say, or sell power uh, into the into these PHEV groups. Uh, and then we can also think about the PHEV groups or the electric vehicle groups as being uh, competitors. But to set a market, we have to do something else. And one way we can do that is to use an auctioning mechanism. So we can have we have a a, a multi-person auction multi-seller, multi-buyer auction to, sit, to model the market, and then that, that sets a price, and then that price is a signal that drives a game among the electric vehicle groups. So the difference here is that here the price is be set by the, uh, the single leader, and here it's sort of set by auction. So I'll start out with this example. 
uh, and then I'll say a little bit about the other one. Okay, so in the first so the first real example I'm going to look at, we're going to have electric vehicle groups that are selling energy into the main grid, which is cons consists of some autonomous buyers. Okay. So we can, first of all, model the market. And this, by the way, is a joint work with Walid, who I mentioned earlier. This is Zhu Han. I think some of you know Zhu. And that's Tamir Bashar from the University of Illinois. <coughs> uh, Zhu is at uh, Houston. So... This is a double, a double auction uh, situation. The, the buyers who are grid elements, main grid elements, are placing bids. Uh, the sellers, are, who are, which are the electric vehicle groups, are placing, uh, are giving uh, reserve prices. And uh, you can plot these in order, and you get a demand, a supply-demand curve. It crosses, and where it crosses, that's the price set by the auction. Okay, and that determines... Uh, where the intersection there determines who are, which, are, which uh, sellers are actually going to sell and which buyers are actually going to buy, and it sets a trading price. So the trading price is just going to be the price that's set at that intersection, you know, average between, you know, just a smoothed out. Uh, and it's going to depend on uh, a, a vector A uh, that are, cons well, consists of the energy that's being put up for sale by each of the electric vehicle groups. Okay, so A sub I is the energy put up for sale by uh, energy group I, and that's the, that's the supply. So as we, if we change that, so that the game is going to be played in terms of the energy groups, uh, the, the vehicle groups, uh, deciding how, each deciding uh, autonomously how, to, uh, how much energy to sell into the market. And so that, that determines the supply. And so that's going to shift the supply-demand curve. So as the game is played, the picture is going to change. Okay, so there's going to be interaction between the result of the auction and the game that's being played. So the, the strategy of each group, as I said, is going to be to choose how much energy to sell into the marketplace, back up to the grid. Uh, and the, the groups are, the vehicle groups are behaving autonomously. So each group is going to choose its uh, uh, strategy to maximize the utility. And the utility that I'm going to use here, could be other things, is just basically the, the, the profit realized, which is the, has to do with the price and the quantity sold, minus a penalty, which uh, is quadratic here. That's the term over, all the way over on the right. And that penalty is just to take into account the fact that this is a vehicle. These are vehicles that have to retain energy so that they can drive home at night. Okay, so there's a penalty. You don't want to sell all your energy out because you do actually have to use this as a vehicle later in the day. Uh, so we have this linear or bilinear quadratic uh, strategy. And now uh, we, we really can't solve this problem analytically, or at least I can't, because of the interaction of the, what, what's happening in the game with this utility and the auction mechanism in the background. So the, the, the vehicle groups choose a, a strategy in turn, and that shifts the supply-demand curve, changes the price. You go to the next vehicle group, they do the same thing, and so forth and so on. And eventually, uh, this is not tr analytically tractable, but it's certainly algorithmically tractable. That is, you can run this and see what happens. So just to, just to show you what happens, um, this is an example where I think there, this is an example where we have the groups have a few hundred vehicles in them, and there's some parameters which I think are parameters for Teslas. Uh, like every academic department, every member owns a Tesla. Uh, and uh, this shows the uh, utility per group versus the number of groups for two algorithms. One is the, the steady state of this game played in the way I just mentioned. Uh, that's the blue one. And the other is the greedy algorithm, which means that all the groups just sell the maximum amount of energy they have directly into the marketplace. So they basically flood the market. And you can see that, as you would expect, the latter strategy is not very good because it drives the price way down. Uh, and as a num particularly as the number of groups increases, uh, the, the supply increases and the, and the price decreases, as you would expect. Now, you have the same phenomenon for this game auction-slash-game uh, uh, algorithm, but 
it's much higher. That is, the utility is much higher. You still have the phenomenon of as the supply increases, the, the price goes down, or the utility per group goes down. But uh, it's, it's still a, a significant margin between that and just a greedy strategy where the players don't uh, interact in this way. Now let me just mention another uh, related problem, what, it's the, the problem I mentioned earlier, where instead of behaving like uh, autonomous uh, players, uh, autonomous entities, the, the grid <coughs> behaves like a single entity. So there's not, you don't need to f have an auction because there's one entity that can do price setting. So that, in that case, we want to use do something like a Stackelberg game, where the main grid is the leader setting the price, and the followers are the electric vehicle groups who then compete once the price has been set. Okay, so uh, I'm not. I, there's a, we have a paper on this which appeared in the Transactions on Smart Grid in September. This is Waze Tushar, uh, who's uh, at, uh, in Singapore. Uh, this is David Smith, who's in Australia, and that's Walid again. Um, and um, basically, we set up a problem in that way. This is actually a problem where the uh, electric vehicle groups are buying energy, but it's the same kind of problem. We have linear quadratic utilities for the uh, electric vehicle groups. Uh, the leader sets the price. They play a game, and then there's an iteration when the leader sets the price, resets the price after he sees uh, how much uh, uh, profit he's going to make. Uh, and the leader's utility is bilinear. It's just price times quantity sold. He doesn't have any penalty. Uh, and in fact, this game is analytically tractable, and we can actually find a Stackelberg equilibrium and so forth for this game. So this can be studied a little bit more analytically than the one I showed before with the auction in it. And this just shows uh, some computations, or these are actually simulations. Uh, what's shown here is the price, the Stackelberg price at equilibrium versus the number of electric vehicle groups, uh, and you can see the price goes up as the number of groups goes up because now the groups are buying, so there's more competition for the commodity. Uh, and you can also see, the, uh, I don't think you can see these, but the, 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 the different lines here are for different total amount of supply. So the, the higher amount of supply, of course, is the lower line because the higher the supply is, the lower the, the price. On the right is just the utility per group. The utility is this linear quadratic thing. And, it, and this compared to a couple of other algorithms, which I don't have time to discuss. But basically, you can see that, like the other case, the utility declines as the number of groups goes up because uh, of the um, increased demand. Okay, so now let me talk. I want to shift gears and talk about a problem that can be modeled using a cooperative game situation. And this is a problem of microgrid interaction. So micro, a microgrid refers to some element down in the distribution network, uh, like a solar array or a wind farm or some load. Um, and these uh, elements trade energy with the main grid, that is the transmission grid, say. Uh, and so one problem that we can look at is whether there's some advantage of microgrid elements to trade energy among themselves rather than to trade back and forth with the, with the macro grid. So, this is a type of cooperation uh, where uh, basically energy is traded between the sources and the loads down in the distribution network in order to achieve some objective. And I'm going to talk about the objective of reducing power losses over, over transmission lines, but that's really in some ways artificial. You could have any kind of objective you want. So this is a, a natural setting for a type of uh, cooperative game called the coalition games. And so I'll say what I mean by that in a second, uh, now. So what's a coalition game? Well, a coalition game consists of a set of players uh, which, which can form coalitions. A coalition is just a group of cooperating players. Uh, and then there's a value function which assigns value to a given coalition. Then the value of a coalition can be divided among the players in the coalition according to some payoff function. Okay, so we have a coalition, has a value, and then that value can be apportioned out to the people in the coalition. Assignment of value. Okay, so then once we have this, we can start, we have a quantitative way of looking at coalitions, uh, of uh, uh, defining coalitions, uh, how they perform, 
And then we can compare coalitions uh, using some kind of ordering based on these this payoffs. So one type of ordering of interest for this kind of problem is Pareto ordering, where uh, the Pareto ordering of between one coalition and another one just means that uh, a, co a coalition is better than another one if one member of the coalition's uh, payoff is larger and no one else's is smaller. A at least one is larger and no one else's is smaller. So it's a kind of a social type of optimization or Pareto, what's called Pareto uh, optimization. So we have a way of comparing coalitions, and then we can start iterating on coalitions by doing mergers and splits. That is, we can merge, uh, we can add players to a coalition and see how, whether that increases the Pareto, that, that increases in the Pareto ordering or not. If it does, we can keep that merge, or then we can try splitting as well. And if we go through and merge and split iteratively, we'll always get to a merge and split proof limit may not be optimal, but it's at least it's merge and split proof. It might, there might be other manipulations that would give you better or, uh, increase in Pareto ordering, but not a merge and split. So again, this is kind of an algorithmic solution to this problem. Uh, but let me just go through and, and give a specific uh, value function here, and, then, and, we'll, and I'll show you some simulation results. Okay. So we have a coalition of microgrids. We can, set, we can divide those into sellers and buyers. Uh, and then for each, for the set, the set of buyers in the coalition, we can choose an ordering pi. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll take the buyers in order, in the order pi, and let them buy uh, energy uh, until they satisfy their demand. Okay, uh, and they'll do that by, uh, and we'll and we'll evaluate that uh, by in terms of uh, the, the in terms of power loss. Okay, so that is the the buyers will want to buy power in a way that minimizes the the power losses on the uh, in the transmission of power back and from the sellers. Okay, so we can that that gives us a function that depends on the ordering and the coalition, uh, which is basically just going to be the sum of power losses for trading within the coalition uh, plus power losses with tra for trading uh, between a seller. And the macro grid, so if there's surplus energy for this particular ordering, we'll sell that back into the macro grid. And if we need energy, uh, we'll have to buy energy from the macro grid, and these are the losses associated with that. And then just so that we'll have something we want to max, uh, minimize, <coughs> we'll put uh, we'll put a minus uh, put a minus sign. Want to maximize? We'll put a minus sign in front of that. Okay. All right, so uh, the value function then is going to, so now we have this, we don't have a value function yet, we just have this criterion here. The value function is for a given coalition is going to be the maximum overall orderings of buyers for that coalition, okay? Uh, and then we, we can uh, apportion that to the members of the coalition fairly. That, that is, we can, we can apportion to, say, the ith element of a coalition, Ith member of a coalition, that amount of this value that it's responsible for. So, forget about the details. I'll just try to explain this a little bit. So, if if a, an element J were to trade energy directly with a macro grid, this is the value of that singleton, right? So, the the value of the coalition minus the sum of the values of the the uh, Individual elements trading directly with the uh, macro grid is the value of, is sort of the residual value of the coalition. That's how much you gain by forming a coalition, and so we can just divide that up among the users according to how much they contribute to that uh, that surplus value. Okay, that's that's what this is. Okay, so we have the everything is set. We have the. Uh, the value we have, we're able to divide it up among the players. Uh, we can start, we have a Pareto ordering, so we can start merging and splitting until we converge. And this is just an example. This is a, a hundred, a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer square. I think there are 10 um, mac microgrid elements in there. They have various properties which are written there. I'm not going to, it's not important for this, but this is the result of running, this is one run of a simulation of that particular um, process, and you can see that, in fact, here it did form 
coalitions. It didn't form the Grand Coalition, which would be not very useful. The Grand Coalition is the coalition of everything, but it does form coalitions uh, of, of buyers and sellers that uh, apparently uh, are optimal in terms of that kind of uh, Pareto ordering. And this just shows a little bit more uh, quantitatively what's going on. This is the average cost per uh, microgrid element. Uh, this is the number of microgrids. And there are two um, schemes shown here. One is the classical non-cooperative scheme, which means that every microgrid element exchanges energy only with the mic the mac sorry, every microgrid element exchanges energy only with the macro grid. So there's no cooperation. And this is the cooperative, the co coalition game, the result of the coalition game. And you can see that, as you would expect, uh, the, uh, there's a savings by cooperation. And in particular, as the number of uh, microgrid elements goes up, uh, the, the amount of savings increases. Because here, they're, they're denser in that case, right? So uh, there's much, much more uh, advantage to cooperating at that point. Now, you don't have to use energy, you don't have to use lo uh, transmission losses. That might not even be realistic. You could apply the same thing with some pricing or what have you. But the, the principle is this, that you've got these elements down in the distribution network, and they can take advantage of that and exchange energy with themselves, among themselves, rather than back and forth with the ma macro grid where there might be higher costs or some other uh, issues. And that's what this is uh, about. Okay, so I want to move on to the next topic. So let me just uh, very briefly wrap this part up. So uh, I've talked briefly about a couple of ideas for game, using game theory for smart grid design. Uh, the first example, that is uh, energy trading, is an example of design, demand side management. That is, the, the demand is down in the uh, um, uh, uh, electric vehicle groups, and they're, ma they're doing their part to help manage the uh, the grid. Uh, and the other one had to do with this integration of, of microgrids. And these are just examples. There are a lot more examples like that, and there are a lot more problems that could be studied in that way. Uh, there is a paper that appeared in the Signal Processing Magazine in September uh, in a special issue on signal processing for smart grid. Uh, and it, some of the things I talked about today are in there, plus some other ideas for using game theory in smart grid. I'll just mention a couple of other problems that are mentioned there. Uh, one is uh, uh, this idea of network formation games. And um, this is a little more traditional kind of communication problem where you have one element of the smart grid is the fact that you have all of these, you have a lot of data being generated out in the grid, sensors, meters, and so forth. Uh, and that data has to be backhauled somehow to a place where it's useful. So one way to back all that is using to use power line. So that is to use the power lines as the medium for communication. The characteristic of power line is that it's very broadband over short distances, but the bandwidth falls off very rapidly with time. I mean, with, with distance. So that means that there's a, you have to use multi-hop transmission, uh, and uh, also you have to share the the medium with all the other meters and sensors and so forth that are out there. So there's a, there's a game, uh, a network formation game there where you, uh, you have the meters and the information sources out in the um, grid competing for the power line uh, network to get back, to backhaul its da their data, okay? And uh, this is a, a competitive game. You can use delay as the utility and do some things there. And this is a appeared in a paper in GameNet slash uh, in, in 11. Another problem that's uh, going to appear in ICC this year is with Waze Tusher again, uh, which has to do with uh, more looking at social optimality in that Stackelberg problem that I, that I described earlier. Uh, there's some other issues here. One is that, you know, and you already saw a little bit of it here, and that is that this is a cyber physical system, of course, but it's also a system with an economic layer. That is, there's a lot of economics in power distribution. And there's also politics in power distribution because it's a regulated industry. So, I mean, this is a problem where you can, you know, in, in wireless, we like to think about cross-layer optimization. And this is a problem where there are multiple layers, and some of them are getting more and more like social, uh, social science layers, you know. So I think it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, 
And also another thing here is the, the incorporation of dynamics. I didn't talk at all about that here, but of course there's a lot of work in the economic literature on dynamic games and also in the control literature. And, uh, and this is a, an area I think that's ripe for some interesting work. All right, so let me, let me shift gears now. I want to talk about the issue of privacy. And what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to talk first about a general formalism for privacy uh, in the, in, for, for data sources in general. And then I'll talk about some applications to Smart Grid. Okay. And this is joint work with another former postdoc of mine, Lalitha Shankar, who's at Arizona State now, and some other people that I'll mention as we go through. Okay, so here's a motivation here. Okay, so I think we all know that there are a lot, there's a lot of information about us out there, okay, online. Uh, you know, there are electronic data repositories held by the government, but there's also Google, Facebook, and you name it. Uh, and also the grid, the smart grid, generates data about us through smart metering, okay. So, of course, the reason all this data is out there is because it's useful. And the utility of the data uh, it depends on its accessibility. If the data were locked away in a vault somewhere, not accessible, it wouldn't be useful at all, okay. On the other hand, it'd be, our privacy would be preserved there, okay. But the more accessible the data is, uh, the more likely it is that they leak private information. Okay, so for any data source, there's a fundamental trade-off between utility of the data and privacy of the data. Uh, and so we might ask the question, how can we characterize that in some way, okay, some meaningful way? Okay, well, we're going to talk about that first in a way that doesn't have anything to do specifically with smart grid, and then you'll see later how this can be applied to smart grid. Okay, so we can model a data source or a, a, a fairly generic data source as a database, okay? And what's a database? Well, a database is a table, uh, and the, the rows of the table correspond to entries. So an entry is an individual, say, whose data is in the database, and the columns correspond to attributes. So, for example, in a, say, in a doctor's office, uh, an entry would be, a, say, a patient visit, right? or maybe a patient, and there would be attributes, gender, age, uh, date of visit, test run, diagnosis, treatment, and so forth, okay? And of course, the way that's used is a querier will make a query to the database, ask it a question, and get back an answer, okay? So um, to model that mathematically, we can think about the rows as being independent and identically distributed random vectors. Okay, of attributes. Okay, and it's, it's reasonable to think that the individual entropies, ent entries might be independent because they're different people, for example. On the other hand, the attributes for a given person won't be independent, so the random vector that this is drawn from will have some general joint distribution. So clearly there'll be correlations between, say, in the example of a doctor's office, you know, there'll be correlations between, say, gender and age and tests that are run, and there'll be a correlation between tests that are run and diagnosis and so forth. So um, there's, there's clear correlation ag across uh, the columns, but independence along the rows. So that gives us a mathematical object to work with. All right. Now these, these attributes can be divided up into two types, public or revealed attributes and private or hidden attributes. Okay. And those may not be disjoint because, for example, think about uh, in, a, in a financial database where your credit card is list number is given. The, the credit card number itself might be hidden, but the last four digits of it might be revealed, okay? Or your Social Security number might be hidden, the last four digits revealed, something like that, okay? So these attributes are divided up into two kinds. The kinds may not be uh, disjoint. Uh, but the main thing is that we have these two different kinds. Now, even if they were disjoint, just talk, again, thinking about that medical database, they're not necessarily independent, okay? So even if you, these were disjoint and you revealed only the revealed data, the hidden data might be correlated with it. So there's, pri pri there's an opportunity for privacy leakage even if you don't have an overlap between private and uh, public variables. All right, so... Uh, I'm going to talk now about work that's joint with Lalitha, who I mentioned before, and this is Raj Rajagopalan, who's at HP Labs. 
So first of all, I want to contrast this problem with the problem of secrecy. I know some people here have been working on secrecy in wireless networks. It's something I've worked on, too. Uh, and in communication secrecy, uh, there's a basic model, which is you have a, so a source, one source, and two receivers, one of which is a legitimate receiver, and the other of which is considered an eavesdropper. So the receiver, there's a dichotomy for the receivers. One is supposed to get the data or the information, and one is not. Okay. Now here we have a, a different kind of dichotomy. We have only one receiver, that is the query initiator, but the source is divided into two types of variables, private and public. So the dichotomy is on the source. There's not really a bad person here. Like here you might think of the eavesdropper as a, an enemy, but here there's no enemy. There's just a querier, right, who's a legitimate user of the database, but there are things in that database that the querier should not see, okay? So with that in mind, how can we characterize this trade-off that we want to, to, to characterize? Okay, well, first of all, so we want to measure utility. Remember what we have is an IID sequence of random vectors with, of two different sorts. So we can measure utility by looking at the distortion of the public variables as revealed to a legitimate user of the database. Okay, so this is, a, this is an inverse measure of utility. If the lower the distortion is, the more useful the information that's given out is to the user. And then we can measure privacy in terms of the equivocation of the private variables in whatever information is revealed to the user. So first of all, if equivocation, if you're not familiar with that term, equivocation just means the, is, the, is a word for the conditional entropy of these variables given the whatever is revealed to the user. Okay, so the entropy measures information content. Uh, you'd like for the equivocation to be high because, of course, if the equivocation is high, that means that there's a lot of residual information that you don't know when, when you, after you've seen the output of the, the query. Okay? So we'd like for distortion to be low and equivocation, to, distortion of the public variables to be low and equivocation of the private variables to be high. That's a good, good utility privacy situation. So now we have, this is all mathematically defined now. We have a stochastic process. We have distortion. We can measure that in some usual ways. Equivocation is defined. So now we have everything defined mathematically, and what we have to do now is to find a way analytically to determine the distortion equivocation region for a given type of database. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, uh, we can turn this into a communications problem. Okay, so first of all, we can think about the way that the database is uh, manipulated by the, when the queries are responded to uh, as, as something called sanitization. That is, we take the, the database, which is just a, a sequence of n random vectors, and quantize it. Okay, so we, we just select uh, some member of a set of, a finite set of databases, and we quantize to that set, and we're going to reveal the quantized database. Okay. So, that, so that's a we can think about that as a communications channel. We have a source, that's the database, divided into two types of uh, 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 attributes, revealed and hidden. The encoder is just the quantizer. The quantized version of the database is revealed to the querier, which is a decodes it to reconstruct the reveal variables from that quantized version. Okay? And then we're going to measure the utility in terms of the distortion that that reconstructed version of the reveal variables uh, has, okay? So this is, you take rho as some metric, look at the average distortion, n is the number of uh, um, entries in the database. So d is going to be a quantity that quantifies how much distortion there is. There's an epsilon there because there's always an epsilon, n goes to infinity, epsilon goes to zero, standard information theoretic setting. Uh, and then we measure privacy in terms of equivocation of the hidden variables given the uh, quantizer output. Okay, so the equivocation, this is, means entropy. This is the conditional entropy of these hidden variables given um, the uh, quantized output. E, we'd like that to be at least E. 
and then there's an epsilon that's going to go to zero as n goes to infinity. So what we'd like to do is to find, for a given source that is given distribution on these variables, find the range of possible D and E. Okay, that's the distortion equivocation region. The frontier of that, or the boundary of that, will be the efficient frontier in this trade-off of utility and privacy. All right, well, to solve that problem, we're going to introduce another variable, which seems like it should make it more complicated, but it actually makes it easier to solve, and that is we can add a rate constraint. We can put an upper bound on the size of the, quantized, the set of quantized <laughs> databases. That's basically, that's basically constraining the rate of this uh, encoder, that is the uh, number of bits per entry uh, per query, okay, uh, and that gives us a, now three things we have to worry about, distortion, equivocation, and rate. Okay, so it seems harder, but actually it's easier for historical reasons, and that's because the problem of trading off rate with distortion is a classical problem in information theory. It's a rate distortion problem, right? So this is really a rate distortion problem with an equivocation constraint. Turns out that problem is also a solved problem in information theory, not, not for this generality, but for a very specific model solved by Yamamoto in the 1980s. So we can apply sort of known machinery to solve this problem. And basically what we can do is we can find the rate distortion equivocation region and then collapse it down to the distortion equivocation plane to find what we're looking for, which tells us the utility privacy trade-off. So just to say a bit more about this, so there, there's, there are three variables, rate, distortion, and equivocation, three axes. And for a given achievable rate uh, distortion equivocation pair, there's a minimum rate that you need to achieve that, okay? And that's a surface. It's hard to see here in two dimensions. Uh, so any rate above that surface will achieve that uh, distortion equivocation pair. And we don't care about rate here. This is not part of this problem, although we might if we had a communication network in the, in the midst that uh, we were worried about. But if we have this function, if, you look, if we look over here in the distortion rate plane, that's that projection there, that's the classical rate distortion function. If we look down in the equivocation distortion plane, that's the distortion equivocation region, and that's what we want. And the, the frontier of that, that is the the, uh, the outer boundary is the efficient frontier. That is, that's where the optimal trade-offs are between distortion and uh, rate and, uh, uh, sorry, distortion and equivocation or equivalently privacy utility. <coughs> okay, so that's a uh, general formalism, and I want to talk about now a couple of applications to smart grid. So the first one is a problem we call competitive privacy. And to, to think about this problem, think about the North American power grid. It's divided up into these so-called regional transmission organizations. Uh, PJM is the one up where I live, uh, Pennsylvania, Jersey, and Maryland. Uh, and these, they control the power going out onto the grid, basically. They estimate, predict, and can turn on resources to meet the predicted load. And they work together to manage the grid. So. In order to have a reliable way of, uh, in order to manage the grid reliably, these RTOs need to share measurements uh, in order to estimate, the, reliably estimate the state of the grid. On the other hand, they're competitors in the marketplace. So they might want to withhold information from one another for econ reasons of economic competitiveness. Okay, so we have a, here a utility privacy trade off reliability of state estimation versus privacy withholding information. So that gives rise to an, a, more gen, a, a larger problem, which we, which we call competitive privacy. That is, look at this privacy utility trade-off when you have actually multiple players in the marketplace competing with one another. So we can set that up uh, mathematically, and this again is Lalitha. This is Shomo Carr, who's at, another former postdoc who's at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, we, we can set that up in this way. So first of all, we can look at a linear measurement model where the kth RTO measures the states of all the different <laughs> RTOs in linear combination plus noise, okay? So this is like a, if you're a communications person, this looks like a multiple access channel or an interference channel, okay? 
Uh, and then the utility for a given RTO is the mean squared error in estimating its own state. Uh, and the privacy for an RTO can be measured in terms of information leakage, just like we talked about in that other, the initial formula, formulation. And it turns out that with this formalism, the answer we can find out the uh, we can solve for the uh, strategy that achieves uh, the optimal privacy utility trade-off for all of the RTOs, and that in fact is for them to use so-called Weiner-Ziv coding. Okay, Weiner-Ziv coding is optimal source coding, uh, noisy source coding for for multiple access systems. Okay, so that's exact. And if you look at this, when you see that, you see that's if you're familiar with Weiner's of coding, you see that that's in fact the answer because we have a multiple access system, we have ba basically uh, a distortion measure, and we're trying to minimize the rate, in the case of Weiner's of coding, the rate of transmission. Here, that's the rate of information leakage, same thing basically. And so it's not surprising that we get Weiner's of coding uh, as the answer to this problem. Another uh, application is in smart metering. Okay, now a smart meter, I think everybody knows what a smart meter is. I don't know if you have them in Raleigh, but smart meter is a meter that's on your house that takes a very, uh, basically real-time measurements of power usage and, and uses those, uh, shares those with the power company in order to uh, help uh, balance the load and so forth. Okay, uh, so it's a useful, smart meter data is useful and it's a part of smart grid. It's part of the demand side management and so forth. On the other hand, smart meter data can leak information about what's happening inside the home. The different uh, appliances you have have signatures that can be uh, detected from smart meter data. So somebody who looks at the smart meter data can tell what's going on inside the house. When you turn on your toaster, your microwave, what happens, what, whatever. So again, there's a trade-off between the utility of this data and the privacy that it, it, that it uh, compromises by being revealed. Okay, so um, uh, this is uh, other work. This is uh, Lalitha and Raj I mentioned before. This is uh, Sohel Mohajer, who's another former postdoc who's at Berkeley now. This is uh, in a paper that's going to appear in the transactions on Smart Grid probably this month. Uh, and it turns out that for this problem, uh, we can, we can find, again, the efficient uh, utility privacy trade-off, and it's a, what we call a reverse water filling solution. Now, this problem is a little different from the, problem, the database problem because now we have a time series problem, right? It's not a, a set of IID vectors, but rather it's a time series. So there's a little bit more to do there. But basically, um, the, pro the solution, given the appropriate modeling, of course, is to look at the spectrum of the data coming off, the uh, smart meter data, and suppress uh, those um, uh, frequencies that have low power. Okay, So that's what we call it reverse water filling. So there's a water filling level, and you can move it up and down to move along the efficient frontier of the trade-off. The, the, the farther, if you move this down, you get more utility, but less privacy, and, and vice versa. Okay, so what's the intuition behind this? Well, the intuition here is that the most informative and probably the least useful information in this smart meter data are transient type data things. Like you turn on your toaster, well, that means you're definitely in the kitchen, right? Or you turn on the tea kettle or what have you. You're, you're definitely there. Things that are, have the most power are really the things like the air conditioner, the refrigerator, who they really don't reveal much about what's going on. So. Suppressing the low uh, power frequencies, you're really suppressing the most informative things uh, without much cost to the utility. Okay, so that's that's the mo that's the intuition there. Now, also, you can be more active in this. Uh, we had a paper at Smart Grid Com. This is Denise Gunduz, who's another former postdoc now at Imperial College. Owner Tan is one of his students, and uh, you can add an energy storage device like a smart uh, like an electric vehicle, uh, and control the, the uh, uh, charging and discharging of that as another way of getting more privacy from the smart meter. That is, you can, you can mask things that are happening. Uh, the, the load, you can mask loads by discharging, for example, the, uh, the battery and so forth. So 
this problem we studied in this paper. We also have a journal paper which is under review for JSAC um, Smart Grid series. Actually, I think it's, it's to appear now. I just saw that. Okay, so just wrap this part up, and then I'll be brief in the last part uh, so I don't go over time. So what we did is we, we looked at this model of the database. We divided the attributes, which are the columns, into private and public variables. This leads to this distortion equivocation uh, characterization of uh, privacy utility trade-off. Uh, we added rate just to make this into a problem we know how to address. It gives us a rate distortion problem with an equivocation constraint. Uh, then we applied this general formalism to two problems in smart grid, competitive privacy and smart metering. Uh, and let me just mention a couple of other problems that not necessarily come up in smart grid, but just generically in this kind of database prob privacy problem. One is the problem where you have multiple queries. So you might just ask the database over and over, and that might reveal things that you wouldn't get on a single query. And in fact, that is different in terms of the privacy utility trade-off. But this can be, mo this can be modeled and, and examined using so-called successive disclosure, which is another problem in information theory. And similarly, you can have multiple databases, right? You can have two databases with a common uh, entry, and then that would help reveal things that neither the single database would, re neither of the databases would reveal individually. And that's a problem with site information. So that adds another dimension to the problem, but also a problem that can be addressed uh, formally. All right, so let me, let me uh, wrap up then with just a few minutes in talking about this last problem, which is this problem of distributed algorithms for state estimation. And this is joint work with Le Ji, who's not a former postdoc of mine. Uh, he's at Texas A&M, okay, and some other people whose names I'll mention later. Uh, okay, so what, let me just motivate this problem. So I, I think I've said a couple times that one of the um, sort of things about the smart grid uh, one of the features is the having more sensing, smart meters, and so forth, producing a lot of data. So there's sort of a big data problem. There's a lot of data out there, and it has to be backhauled. To be used together, it has to be backhauled somewhere, okay? So you can have communication bottlenecks and so forth, okay? Also, uh, there's more decentralization because as deregulation uh, advances in this industry, there are more and more RTOs are also going to be called here control areas, more and more autonomous operators. Um, on the other hand, if you want to have a smart grid, you have to have situational awareness. You have to know what's going on. Okay? So that means there's interest in finding distributed estimation uh, algorithms that allow us to, do, to estimate the state of the system, but only with local exchange of information. Okay? Now, distributed estimation is an old problem. It's not a new problem. But there is something different here that makes it more interesting. Uh, and that's like, uh, that's, uh, the, it could be described in very the simple model here. So there are basically two networks in smart grid. There's the physical network, which is connected by power lines, right? And then there's the cyber network, which is connected by a communication network, okay? And they're not necessarily the same. They don't have the same topology. Okay, so this is what makes this problem different from sort of classical um, distributed estimation that you might do for sensor networks, say. That is, you have uh, the thing that you're trying to make inferences about has one topology, and the thing you're making inferences with has another topology. So that adds another dimension to the problem. Okay, so what we like to do is to find, in that setting, distributed state estimation. Okay. All right, and here, here's a very simple model. This is a static or DC model uh, for a situation. So the state we're interested in is the set of all phase angles on all buses in all of the control areas, so the whole grid, all the phase angles in the grid. Each uh, local observation, each control area has its own local model, a lo local observation model, which is just uh, a linear uh, a matrix times the uh, the system state, and the matrix is the Jacobian of the connections, connectivity of the grid itself. Okay, so this is the physical grid, tells us what H is, plus noise. So that, that's what we have, and what we'd like to do is to estimate theta at every control area. Okay, 
Now, now uh, here's an algorithm that we can uh, uh, use to do that, and I'll, I'll show you that it does that. And first of all, this is Le. This is one of his students. This is Shomo, who I mentioned before at Carnegie Mellon. And this has also appeared in the transactions on Smart Grid in September. So um, here, here's an algorithm that we can use, that we can propose as a distributed state estimator for this problem. So at, at the nth control area, we're going to iterate in time t. At t plus 1, the estimate is the estimate at time t with two correction terms. This is a term for consensus correction. So this is omega n is the neighbor is the cyber neighborhood of the nth control area, and we'd like to achieve consensus in estimation with our neighbors, okay? And then this is the usual incorporation of residual, okay? So we have, without this, it's sort of a classical residual update, and without this, it's a classical consensus update, okay? And then we have some coefficients, beta and alpha, which have to be programmed to make this thing converge. Okay, so, so Remember, the measurement model has the uh, topology, uh, incorporates the topology of the physical network. This the algorithm incorporates the topology of the uh, cyber neighborhood. And then, of course, this also incorporates the topology of the physical network. All right, well, it turns out that if we have global observability of the grid, so the physical network is globally observable, which is just this condition mathematically, and the cyber network is connected, meaning that the graph Laplacian, the second eigenvalue, is positive, then we can get almost sure convergence of all of these dis uh, distributed state estimators to uh, globally squares, okay, assuming we appropriately program the alphas and the betas. So just like any kind of iterative algorithm, they have to go to zero, but not too fast, okay? So there's some details in that paper, but that's basically the idea. So how do you prove this? Well, you first prove that consensus is achieved, and then you can, sh and then you can show that that consensus uh, converges together with an iterative least squares al global least squares algorithm. So it's just mostly just analysis. And I'll wrap up with just a couple of examples. So these are two of the IEEE test bus systems. Uh, these are globally observable, both of them. Uh, all of the control areas in each of these systems are globally unobservable. That is, no control area can by itself estimate the global state. And some of the control areas are even locally unobservable. That is, they can't estimate their own state. The pink ones uh, can't even estimate their own state accurately. Okay. So here we have the physical network, which is the grid. These dashed lines show the cyber network, and there are two different ones. In each case, just I'll show you why I did that in a minute. And this, we know it converges. We've already proved it, but this just shows it. Here we pull out a few particular phase angles, and this just shows convergence uh, of these algorithms in both cases uh, to the global least squares. Uh, this, and here we can show see sort of some robustness to the communication topology. This is the 14 bus system. There were two different communication topologies. They're both connected, so it's going to converge in both cases, and this just shows that for this example. All right, so uh, let me just wrap this up then, and then I'm almost done. So let me just uh, talk about a few other things of interest. First of all, everything I talked about here was for a static DC model. Uh, you can also have a nonlinear uh, state estimation, which is the AC model. It's in that same paper. We do the same thing, and you get similar type results. Uh, another problem, more communication-oriented problem, is the problem of multicast routing, uh, where uh, here you have sensors taking data that needs to be routed to actuators and so forth to stabilize, say, the, the grid, but the sensors don't necessarily know which actuators have to get their data. So there's a routing, sort of interesting routing problem where the, route, the stability of the physical network depends on the the routing algorithm in the cyber network. And you can look at that problem and analyze it and come up with some algorithms that assure stability. This is some joint work with Li Feng uh, Li, who's another, uh, I'm sorry, Hu Xing Li, who's a former student of mine, who's now at Tennessee, and Li Feng Lai, who's another former postdoc at, who's at WPI. 
Uh, and then uh, just uh, to show that all this stuff can be tied together, I put this paper here. This is a, there's a, we did, have recently done some work with Veronica Belmega, who's another former postdoc and now in France, uh, where we put all this stuff together and look at a game theoretic model. This is a, a dynamic game problem where we try to do distributed state estimation with private, with, that's privacy aware. That is, we don't, we, we exchange information, but like, it's like competitive privacy where we don't want to exchange all the information that we have. So I just mentioned that because um, it puts all three of these things in one paper. All right, so let me just wrap up, and then I'm out of time, so I'm out of slides too. Uh, I talked about three things today, game theoretic methods for design, privacy utility trade-offs, and distributed algorithms. So with that, I'm done, and I'm happy to take questions. We have 1,000 global states that we want to estimate. Each agent needs to share its estimate of all those 1,000 global states with the neighbor, right? It, it's, yeah, so to make that work, uh, that's a good point, actually. So the, the, the amount of, I don't know if you're getting at the amount of communication overhead uh, yeah. involved, but the algorithm works by. Um, yeah, right here, in order to compute this consensus penalty, you have to know the estimates of all your neighbors, right? So if the state has a thousand, has a, th a vector of a thousand states, you got you got to share it all, right? With your neighbors. So, but but I mean the the point is it only with your neighbors. You don't have to just you have to flood the whole grid with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I have a follow up about one last question. So. Uh, for the state estimation, so at which point we can actually use this estimation? Because as a network, it's always changing somewhere, right? And uh, as, a, as a global estimator, I never know so why everything converts. So mathematically, I know it converts, but how can you know where it already converts? Rather than in a state that uh, something is changing in a part? Yeah, no, no, I mean, this is a classic problem in, in state estimation, right? I mean, you know, so this is static state estimation, so the state is a point in a vector space, right, I mean, a vector. You know, I mean, of course, it, if the state has dynamics of its own, then you have to do Kalman filtering or something like that, right? I mean, so it's just a, you know, I mean, that, that this, this, is a, this is an algorithm more like least squares or RLS or something than it is like Kalman filtering, right? But so you can start applying the same principles with a dynamic state. We haven't done that. It's an interesting problem. And you're not going to get, you're not going to get this, right? You're going to get tracking error something like that. And hopefully you'll get a steady state tracking error of some sort. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, the state could be changing. Right? So the idea is you run this really fast. The time scale here is much faster than the time scale of the system. So. Other questions or comments? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, in terms of uh, using uh, non-corporate non game to compute purposes, so we know uh, in game theory, so the Nash is living, not always optimal. Yes. From the second point, further point of view, so the, in the physical dilemma, so the, the prisoner makes each other very badly. Mm -hmm. So how can we prevent this happen when we use this kind of idea to control our power system? Well, I mean, you know, there's, there's, so there's a gap between the Nash equilibrium and what you could do if you had, if you were optimized, if you were the centralized optimizer, right? No, that's true. But I mean, that's sort of the nature of the, the beast, right? I mean, you don't use game theory when you've got, if you can do global optimization, there'd be no reason to use game theory, right? I mean, so it's, it's a valid point, but I mean, un unless you want to give the power company, say, control of all of those elements, right, then this is really a way to do it. That's another way to do it. You could just, everybody could say, I'm going to let the power company control that, and it might actually be better for everybody. But, you know, that's another, that's a political decision. So. <laughs> in what situation uh, would you like to have your car, uh, you drive to work, you park in the parking lot, you plug in, and, and the battery goes down? 
So it, it, no, no, I, that's why there's a penalty term, right? I mean, you only want enough. You want enough energy to go back home, right? So. What if my my wife calls and says, "Can you pick up the milk?" Uh, sorry, I can't because I. I <laughs> <laughs> you should have gotten married. <laughs> 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 uh, look. You know, it's you're, you're trading off utility for. I mean, you're going to get paid for this, right? I mean, so it's going to be you're going to enjoy the benefits. <laughs> you're going to enjoy the benefits of being part of this. I'll get the beer and drink it all, right? Yeah. <laughs> there, I'm stuck, but at least you know. There, there's probably a parameter you can t tweak and say I'm really more worried about being able to go out in the middle of the day, and so I'm going to put because there's that penalty term. Let me just bring that up here, somewhere back here. There's a penalty term on the there's a quadratic penalty term there, um, and uh, wherever it is, there it is. So you can just say my pricing factor is very high because I'm worried about that. But if you're put loose and fancy free, and you only you know that you're only going to have to go home at five o'clock or six o'clock, then you can lower your and you can benefit more. So that's it's a good point. I mean, the most conservative thing is the Keep your car full all the time, right? But you know, this is a, a way to make some money in the daytime. You know, you, you bought energy cheap at night, you sell it back in the daytime at a higher price. So. I do have one, one last question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my question is actually a little bit more generic, but, but in the context of, of this PHEV problem. So uh, I'm assuming that uh, this optimization is being solved by the utility in real time. Right? As the cars are on the road, I guess. Yeah. So if the optimization is being solved in discrete time, while the physical behavior of the of the PHEVs are evolving in continuous time, don't you think that there should be some kind of synchronization involved? You know, I, I mean, if if we are posing this problem as a cyber physical problem, so this is the cyber layer which is being solved, you know, by computers yeah. in the utilities, right? But then the physical behavior, that's not a discrete time. That's happening because of the physics of the problem. Yeah, it's yeah. Always in People are having to go out and uh, do run errands and things like that. Right. Yeah. No, so no, you're right. I mean, this is, a, like I said, a very simple model, you know, for theoretical analysis, get some insight. But, you know, what, if you were to implement it, you would have all kinds of issues, right? I mean, that have to be considered. Just like when we study, use information theory to study communications problems. It, it's not, that's not a design. That's really a... Some give you intuition. So. Yeah. Hi. Last one. Last one. <laughs> In the how about the privacy between RTOs data exchange? Was there any interesting outcome? What is the outcome of that study? What did it show? Well, it shows that what you should do is to reveal. Well, you you should reveal um, the the least uh, information possible uh, to 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 get the optimal estimate of your, the, the best, the minimum distortion estimate of your state. And the answer, I mean, it's a theoretical result. The answer is to use a weiner ziv coding, basically, which is, uh, tells you how to encode your data to transmit it to the other RTOs, basically. In that application, the data is very specific. Yeah, yeah. Whether I'm going to send voltage measurement or not. Well, I mean, here we're treating data as information bits, right? I mean, it's not... Uh, you know, this you have you have information is quantitate. You know, it, it's uh, quantified as bits, and how many bits do you exchange? Basically, entropy is measured in bits. So again, this is a very pristine model just to try to get some intuition about uh, about that. Now, if you start giving in different kinds of information, different weights, then that's a that's a different uh, thing. It's just like you doing um, uh, encoding data where you have the most significant bits are used for the most important data bits and so forth. And you know, you can start doing things like that here too. This is really just sort of step one. Yeah, that's a good point. Though. It's an interesting so. study. In your game theoretic approach in the first part, you uh, mostly sort of uh, talked about uh, some of the financial costs of mm -hmm. things. But uh, some of us actually in this room also are interested in the reliability of uh, basically the, that is a cost as well. Yeah. Uh, has anybody looked at that, that kind of uh, optimization where you fold in the, the, the failure, the potential for failure, and things like that? You know? uh, interesting. So m maybe looking at the stability of the network, for example? 
or? Well, the, you know, the, for instance, the, what we're interested in is Right. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. So, like uh, cascading failure, that sort of thing. I, I mean, there is work in that area, but I don't know if they've been using game theory for that work. So, I don't know. Interesting. All right. Interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you all.